to know. And make sure you stay tuned to the end of the video because I'm going to show you all the countries where a wealth tax has failed before. Let's dive right in. Number one, Elizabeth Warren's wealth tax of 2% on anything over 50 million and 3% on anything over a billion is completely impossible logistically. It's unmeasurable and unpayable by the majority of the people that it affects. Since the majority of wealth that this tax targets is in public and private companies, let's go ahead and use two examples. Number one, WeWork, and that's a private company. And number two is Tesla, and that's a publicly traded company. Adam Newman is the CEO of WeWork. He owns about 10% ownership. I'm, I'm not sure if that's exact, but we'll use 10% as this example. And Elon Musk owns 13.4 million shares of Tesla. Now let's try to figure out how much they would actually owe. And I think you'll start to see the problem. We'll start with Elon Musk. He's got 13.4 million shares in Tesla. Last year, the stock price of Tesla fluctuated between $379 per share and $176 per share. That would mean that Elon Musk's wealth was between $5 billion and $2.3 billion. <laughs> you see where I'm going with this? So does he owe $150 million in tax? at 3% or does he owe 70 million in tax at 3%? And oh, but wait, there is more. Let's look at Adam Newman. His 10% ownership of WeWork is worth what? <laughs> it's a privately held company. You don't get a quote on it by the second. So how would we determine how much Adam Newman would owe? But George, that's not a problem because you could just value the company based on the last round of funding. Let's see how that would play out in the real world. Welcome to the real world. As of about a month ago, based on their last round of funding, WeWork was valued at 47 billion. At 10% ownership, that would mean that Adam Newman, his wealth is about 4.7 billion. 3% of that, his tax liability would be 129 million. But about three weeks after they had this valuation, they had a botched attempt at going public. This was really, really bad, which drove down market estimates, estimates of the valuation down to $10 billion, which means that Adam Newman's wealth would have gone from 4.7 down to one, in other words, he would have been overtaxed or his wealth would have been overstated at the time he was taxed by $3.7 billion. But let's just assume that you could wave the magic wand and quantify someone's wealth precisely. How would they actually pay the tax? Let's say that right now Elon Musk's wealth is $4 billion. And keep in mind that changes literally by the second. How many of you watching this video right now thinks that Elon Musk has $4 billion just sitting in his bank account? Of course, that's a trick question. <laughs> and how, how many of you watching this video right now think that 99% of Elon's wealth is actually in the shares that he owns of Tesla? Well, hopefully you said the latter. So if this $4 billion is in actual equity of the company that he owns, and it's not just sitting in the bank, then how does he pay the 100 million or 150 million that he owes in tax? Obviously he can't just give the IRS shares of Tesla. George, this is simple. All he'd have to do is just sell some shares to pay the tax. So let's just say that Elon did decide to sell shares in order to pay that tax. What would that do to the share price of Tesla? It would absolutely tank, which would mean that Elon Musk's wealth would no longer be four billion. It would be whatever this adjusted share price is relative to how many shares he owns. So the wealth tax or the amount of tax that you calculated based on this number, the very next day would no longer be accurate. But it gets better. Let's go over to Adam Newman. 
Remember, WeWork is a private company. It's not publicly traded. So Adam Newman doesn't have the option of just taking shares, selling them out to the open market and using that money to pay his tax liability. So his only option would be to borrow against the equity that he has in the company. But if he did that, he'd have to pay interest on a moving forward basis for the money that he borrowed to pay the tax in the first place. It just gets completely crazy. Additionally, if the value of WeWork went down far enough, he'd get a margin call, which could potentially bankrupt the entire company. The same would hold true for Tesla if Elon Musk decided to borrow against his shares instead of sell them to pay that debt. But more on the margin calls later. Number two, 100 years later, it's still the same scam. Check out this news article, and I want you to tell me who is saying this. Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren? It's meant to impose only very low tax rates on only the highest incomes. It would force the so-called robber barons to pay taxes. So was that Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders? The answer is neither. That's actually what they were saying about the income tax over a hundred years ago in 1913. Notice that it was sold as a panacea and that it would only affect a very, very small group of robber barons, or in this case, billionaires. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Additionally, the income tax was never supposed to affect the middle class. Question, how long did it take the government to start lowering the amount that would actually qualify for the minimum tax rate? Answer, not very long. Right here, we've got the ceiling on the lowest tax bracket adjusted for today's dollars. It started off at $518,000. Notice by 1925, that was down to $58,000. And then you go to your 1975, it got all the way down to $5,000. And look at what the tax rate was. The tax rate at this time was 5 15%. So if you're only making five grand a year, you had to pay 15% of that to the government. Of course, there was exemptions and whatnot, but you can see how this works. And the biggest thing that I want to point out right here is this wealth tax doesn't kick in until you have 50 million in assets. In other words, the lowest tax bracket is $50 million for the wealth tax. The lowest tax bracket for the income tax, remember in 1913, was 518,000. But this went all the way down to 5,000. So if we had the same type of decrease from 50 million for a wealth tax, that would take us all the way down to 500,000. So for those of you watching this that own your own home, ask yourself, how many of you are worth $500,000? And then take it one more step and notice that in 1913, any income over 518,000 paid 2% or more. But by the time we get to 1975, it's 15% or more. So if we're starting the wealth tax at 2% or more, by the time we get to 500,000, where are we gonna be? Are we gonna be 15% or more? So if you've got that home that's valued at $500,000, what are you gonna have to pay? Two, three, four, 15% of your wealth to the government? That's where this is going. Question. How long was the form that you had to fill out for your income taxes in 1913? If you guessed four, you were right. And that included the instructions page. And today, how many pages is that same form? 117. Here's the bottom line. The wealth tax will gradually move down until almost everyone is paying it, just like the income tax. And I'd like to remind you that the Warren wealth tax has a 40% exit tax. 
meaning that if you want to leave the country, you've got to give 40% of your money to the government before you leave. Think about this for a minute. You're getting a glimpse into the future. Right now, the United States is 22 trillion in debt. We are the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. And that's with a quote unquote booming economy and low unemployment. What happens in the next recession? We're currently running trillion dollar plus deficits. So in the next recession, those deficits will go through the roof. The state pensions are going bust. Social security is almost bust. If you're in the middle class or above, pretty soon they will be coming after your money. And if they're coming after your money, they're not going to allow you to take it out of the country. If you can't leave the country with your money, then basically what we have in the United States is a financial Berlin wall. And I honestly don't think that's being conspiratorial. I don't think I'm wearing the tinfoil hat here. I'm not being hyperbolic. I just think that's reality. Number three, less capital investment. There's a big misunderstanding with the general public that these rich guys or girls, these billionaires and millionaires, they just keep all their money stashed somewhere. Maybe it's buried in a hole in their backyard or in a secret Swiss bank account, or maybe it's off in some exotic Cayman Island, but wherever it is, it's out of the clutches of everyone else and they're just stashing it away so no one else can grab it. So why not just take some of that money and bring it over here to help the poor? The problem with that is they don't understand where that money actually is. See, it's not in a hole in someone's backyard. The majority of it's not in a Swiss bank account. It's not in the Cayman Islands. Where it is, is in private companies. It's an investment of startups and angel investing and private companies and public companies that make our lives better, that make society's life better from a standpoint of convenience like an Uber, or maybe they open up our world to different possibilities like Apple. Maybe they give us cheaper goods like Amazon or just a great cup of coffee like Starbucks, or maybe they're doing everything in their power to make the world a better place and to combat climate change like a Tesla. These companies would not exist if it wasn't for the capital investment of these billionaires and rich millionaires. Not only will there be less savings and investment, there will be dramatically less. Think about it. What will the rich do if their wealth is under attack? What would you do? You'd leave because you know damn well that if it's 3% this year, it'll be 10% in three years, and it'll be 20% in 10 years. But George, Elizabeth Warren's plan has an exit tax. So that will prevent the rich from leaving the country. Theoretically, that is true. But you'll find that the rich are very good at getting themselves and their wealth out of the country. They just simply have a lot more resources than we do. So what ends up happening is the middle class, the average people, who don't have those resources to get themselves and their wealth out of the country get stuck holding the bag and they're the ones that end up paying the taxes. Number four is a chain reaction of wealth decreasing. It's kind of like a negative feedback loop. Remember before in the video, we talked about a margin call. Let's discuss that briefly. We've got Elon Musk here in his Tesla hat. Let's just say that he's got 10 billion of equity. These aren't exact numbers that I'm using. I'm just using these as an example. So on this 10 billion in equity he has, he would owe 300 million in taxes. And in order to do that, he would either have to sell the shares, which would be a really bad idea, or he'd have to borrow against those shares or borrow against that equity. He'd have to take a loan from the bank. So he goes to the bank and says, listen, I've got this 10 billion here. I need a loan of 300 million. The bank isn't going to take 300 million in Tesla shares as collateral. They're going to take a heck of a lot more. So he has to pledge, let's say a billion dollars of Tesla equity in order to get this 300 million cash to pay the IRS. But remember over the past 52 weeks, the share price of Tesla has fluctuated between $379 and $176. So let's just say that he takes out this loan when the share price is $379. So he's getting this $300 million based on the share price of 379. 
If the share price goes down to 176, this could trigger what they call a margin call. That means that the bank says, whoa, 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 our collateral is losing too much value. So at a certain price, we're gonna completely liquidate all of the shares that Elon pledged us to make sure that we get our collateral back. This could actually create a chain reaction that makes Tesla go out of business. Next, let's talk about a recession. So what's gonna happen is the government is gonna set up all of these programs based on this funding that's coming in from the wealth tax. We've got program XYZ, ABC, and my favorite is when they set up a task force. So the poverty task force. And all these things are to do more good. And let's say that they've got 200 billion coming in from this wealth tax every single year. Remember that the majority of these taxes or the majority of the wealth in the United States is concentrated into assets. If we have even a mild recession, let alone a recession that we saw in 2009, the value of that wealth, so the value of those assets are gonna completely plummet. So these government programs are set up with 200 billion coming in. If we have a recession and that decreases the amount of wealth that we have, that decreases the amount of taxes, let's say the taxes go down to 50 billion, who's gonna plug that shortfall? It's gonna then go onto the shoulders of average Joe, like it does every single time. And that's really our end game here. They're gonna create more inflation and or they're gonna increase taxes. The very people that this wealth tax is intended to help are the very people that it's gonna hurt in the long run. Now, those of you watching this video could be saying to yourself, but George, I realize there's a lot of issues, but it does give some money to the people who need it most. Wrong, it doesn't. Most of the time when they try this wealth tax, it doesn't generate the expected money. Sometimes it doesn't generate any money at all, and sometimes it's even a loss. Remember FATCA? That was the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. And in 2016, it cost the United States government between 200 billion and a trillion dollars to implement and to execute. How much money did it bring in? According to the Wall Street Journal, 13.5 billion. <laughs> so it very well could have cost the taxpayer a trillion dollars just to try to get additional taxes from people who are overseas. It's complete insanity. And that's the same thing that could happen to this wealth tax. Elizabeth Warren can pitch it as though it's gonna bring in XYZ dollars but she's not factoring in the reality of all the administrative costs, the red tape and the bureaucracy. This is a boondoggle that could end up actually costing the taxpayer more than it brings in. And let's not forget, since FATCO was implemented, 15,000 Americans actually renounced their citizenship. And these aren't poor people, these aren't middle class. These are the super rich, the wealthy, that would have invested in companies. Remember the capital investment? They would have provided money to the next Uber, to the next Apple, to the next Tesla, and now they're gone. They took their capital, and they're investing that capital somewhere outside of the United States. And what does the US have to show for all that capital flight? A $1 trillion loss. And you could be saying to yourself, yeah, George, but that's FATCA. This is a wealth tax. It's a lot different. But this is not the first time that a wealth tax has been tried. In the 1970s, the British government tried to implement almost the exact same thing. And here's what happened. This is a direct quote from Dennis Healy, who was the minister in charge at the time. We had committed ourselves to a wealth tax, but in five years, I found it impossible to draft one which would yield enough revenue to be worth the administrative cost and the political hassle. All right, guys, the moment you've all been waiting for the bonus, where has the wealth tax failed? Austria, Finland, Germany, Iceland, Ireland, Luxembourg, Netherlands,
Sweden. You would think after it's failed in all these places that we as Americans would look at that as an example of what not to do. But the takeaway from this entire video is that the wealthy won't end up paying the wealth tax. The people that'll end up paying the wealth tax are the middle class. And they'll do that through additional direct taxes and indirect taxes coming from massive inflation. And if you wanna know how to not only survive inflation, but thrive in inflation, check out this video right here where I tell you how you can profit from an inflationary environment. You'll discover everything that you need to know. And we'll see you on the next video.